Hello and welcome to Keep It Classical. Today we are going to talk about the High or Late Renaissance, what that means, and some composers associated with it, as well as their compositions and compositional styles. Of all the epochs of music we're going to look at, the Renaissance has the longest duration. We often divide it further into subsections called Early, Middle, and Late or High Renaissance. One of the reasons it's called the High Renaissance is because the number of composers and compositions continues to grow exponentially. During this last period, we focus mostly on four composers, Palestrina, Lassus, Bird, and Victoria. We'll talk about them and some of their contemporaries in the next few videos. Anyway, on to the rest of the Counter-Reformation. Let's get started. In the previous video, we talked about how the Council of Trent was considering actions to take in response to the Protestant Reformation. Among other things, the Council was concerned that the words in their music was being obscured, and consequently polyphonic music in the Catholic Church was on the chopping block. Thankfully, cooler heads prevailed, and a composer from the Netherlands named Jacob de Kerle was able to demonstrate that words could be intelligible, was able to demonstrate that words could be intelligible in polyphonic music. Italian composer Vincenzo Ruffo was also commissioned to write masses and motets based around these new guidelines for word intelligibility. His efforts, while valiant, are not what one might call impressive. There's nothing wrong with his music, it's just four voices singing a very chordal setting of the mass. The weird thing about this whole situation is that this music isn't polyphonic, it's homophonic or chordal in nature. If you need a reminder about the definitions of homophony and polyphony, you should go back and watch my video about the birth of polyphony. Now that comment is not meant to imply that homophonic music is less valuable than polyphonic music, so calm down. It's just describing what the music is. After all that fuss about polyphonic music and threatening its use in church, the powers that be were basically placated by a homophonic setting of the mass. But this happens all the time administrators and bigwigs making decisions about things that they know little to nothing about. Now, thankfully, we get to talk about one of the greatest composers to emerge during this time, Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina, or John Peter Lewis from that one town. There's a lot we don't know about his childhood. What we do know is that he was probably born around the year of 1525 in the small town of Palestrina, which is how he gets his name, like da Vinci and that he began his training as a choir boy in Rome at Santa Maria Maggiore in 1537. After his training, he returned to his hometown of Palestrina, where he began working as Maestro di Canto and met Cardinal Giovanni Maria del Monte, or John Mary from the mountains, who was serving as the Bishop of Palestrina. Cardinal del Monte actually would go on to be elected Pope Julius III, and took Palestrina back to Rome with him. There, he would become one of the mainstream, if not the mainstream composer of Rome, one of the most influential composers of the Catholic Church during the High Renaissance, and eventually one of the greatest composers of Western classical music. There is a big misconception that Palestrina saved polyphonic music after the Council of Trent almost gave it the axe. This isn't true, but what he did do was establish what polyphonic music looked like in the Catholic Church after the Council of Trent. A great example of this is one of his masses titled Misse Pape Marcelli, or the Pope Marcellus Mass. At times his music is very homophonic, and other times his music is purely polyphonic, and Palestrina manages to strike a beautiful balance between the two. Let's listen to two examples. First, the Gloria, which features several homophonic passages, and second, the Agnus Dei, which features several polyphonic passages.
Now the question is, how was Palestrina able to get away with these polyphonic passages without angering the powers that be? Remember, the main complaint of the Council of Trent is that the words were unintelligible. Now let's look at the text of these two movements, Gloria and Agnus Dei. Now looking at them side by side, you can see that there's a much larger quantity of words in the Gloria than in the Agnus Dei. You can also see that there are many more repeated words in the Agnus Dei than in the Gloria. Because of this, Palestrina is going to treat the Gloria more homophonically, that way he can get through this large quantity of different sounding words more easily. Likewise, when you're only repeating two words, Agnus Dei, you can meditate on them with staggered entrances. You don't need to worry about the words overlapping, because there are only two of them. And they were declared pretty clearly towards the beginning of the movement. Intelligibility is not an obstacle in this movement the way it is in the Gloria. Because of this compromise of sorts, polyphony continues to be used in music after the Council of Trent. Another great composer that we must talk about is Orlando de Lassus, sometimes referred to as Roland de Lassus, Orlando de Lasso, Orlandus Lassus, Orlando de Latre, or Roland de Latre. That's a lot to get through. Why so many different names? It's the same name in different languages. Lassus was a very well-traveled composer who found himself working in several different countries and speaking several different languages. He was born in modern-day Belgium in a small town called Mont. He went from Mont to Mantua, to Sicily, Milan, Naples, Rome, Antwerp, and then finally to Munich, where he spent the remainder of his life. As a result of all these travels, he is fluent in French, Italian, German, and of course, Latin. And he would write in all of these languages fluently, prolifically, almost effortlessly. Like Palestrina, Lassus lived and worked his life in a world after the Council of Trent, and had to adjust his writing accordingly. Consequently, he found a balance between homophony and polyphony just like Palestrina did. Interestingly though, both of them continued to incorporate secular music into their sacred music after the Council of Trent. Lassus and Palestrina also found themselves working in a new genre at the time called spiritual madrigals. Spiritual madrigals are a difficult genre to explain. They're religious pieces, but they're written in the vernacular as opposed to Latin. But they're not secular pieces because their subject matter is religious. Sometimes they're about Mary, and sometimes they're about St. Peter, and sometimes they're about Jesus. They occupy this beautiful gray area between sacred and secular. In any case, these compositions are some of the most beautiful, striking, and moving compositions of the High Renaissance. Let's look at a spiritual magical by Lassus from a larger work called Lagrime de San Pietro, or The Tears of St. Peter. This work is a collection of 21 spiritual madrigals for seven voices, which sets poems by Petrarch about when St. Peter denies he knows Jesus three times, and the immense guilt that engulfs Peter after this betrayal. A heavy subject matter, and not exactly easy listening, but unquestionably a masterpiece. I have to warn you, if you're feeling guilty about anything in your life, you should come back to this music after you've resolved that matter. It's also the last work that Lassus composed before his death in 1594.
I personally can't choose a favorite between Palestrina and Lasus. However, in my personal opinion, and this is just my opinion, if I had to compare the feelings of these two composers in a way that perhaps oversimplifies things, it would be that Palestrina composes with a heavenly voice, and Lasus composes with a more earthly perspective. This is by no means saying that one is better than the other. Sometimes I want that angelic vantage point, and other times, I need to listen to something with a more humanistic point of view. It is fair, though, to say that these two composers were masters and a fairly equal ability and vision. Do you have a favorite between Palestrina and Lasus? Leave your comment down below. That's all for now. Next time, we're going to talk more about how the Renaissance progressed in England. If you like this video, consider watching one of my other videos talking about Renaissance music or the birth of polyphony. And remember, keep it classical.